Hello and welcome back to Mortars and Motors. For three years in the 1990s, these three models were sold alongside each other by Fiat. You're about to tell me that no they weren't because the Panda was discontinued in 1995, but you would be wrong because in Italy the Panda continued until 2003. The Cinquecento, launched in 91 but sold in the UK from 93, was discontinued in 98 when it moved on to the Seicento. And the Morea over there, which is also the Bravo and Brava in a slightly different body style, uh, was launched in 1996 and ran until about 2002. So from 1996 to 1998, these cars were sold alongside each other. So 25 years later, let's see how they stack up. Now let's start with the classic Fiat Panda. This design was launched in 1980, uh, about the same time as the Austin Metro, so it really traces its design heritage back to the very late 70s. The Cinquecento next to it was launched a decade later in 1991, and the Morea about another five years later. And you can really see the design language change between the three cars. This is very angular, it has a very flat windscreen, it's very boxy. The Cinquecento, a decade later, really shows the advancement of car design, which has gone for the much more aerodynamic wedgy shape uh, from sort of the late 80s fashion. And then you have the Morea, which is in proper 90s style. It's all very blobby and bubbly. And there's another reason why I've arranged the cars in this order. The Panda, although is bigger than the Cinquecento, is much cheaper than the Cinquecento. In mid-90s prices, the Panda would have been something along the lines of £5,000. This would have been about six to six and a half, and this would have been about 12. Let's start then with a closer look at the Panda. Although it was launched in 1980, this is actually a facelift version from 1986 called the Panda Supernova. The major revisions for the second generation uh, version of the Panda is at the rear. Uh, it's got a completely new suspension system, getting rid of the old leaf springs. And you can always tell a second generation uh, original Panda because it's got this kink in the rear wheel arch to match the front one, whereas the original Panda design had it squared off. This particular Panda may be familiar to uh, viewers as being the world's most travelled Fiat Panda belonging to my good friend Jim McGill. And by furthest travelled, I don't necessarily mean that it might have the highest mileage of any panda, but it certainly has travelled to the furthest flung corners of the earth compared to most other pandas. Let's get into the panda and see what it's all about. The first contact that you get with the panda is this uh, very sort of 80s push-button system that was around in very basic cars. Opening the door reveals a pretty spartan looking door card, uh, which is trimmed in very simple fabric with a lot of body coloured metal on show. You do get a door pocket, however, which is very exciting, and obviously manual window winders and internal mirror adjustment, which is pretty good for an economy car in the early 90s. Stepping into the car for a moment, you might not quite notice where the actual handle to release the door is, but it is part of the grab handle. Little ingenious design, we lift it up like that. Hey. Looking around the inside cabin of the Panda, you've got this very classic Panda design, which is to have the instrument pod sitting on a fabric shelf. Uh, it was always a design of the Panda, although this later version of the Panda has a much bigger uh, sort of instrument cluster area than the very earlier models. But this really is fabric. It's, it's kind of squishy and uh, is a useful shelf over there for some oddments. And you've got this very cool uh, ashtray that slides along so you can have it sort of nearer the driver if you want it or the other side for the passenger. I think it also lifts off as well if you want to. There are two speaker pods, one over there and one over there on the driver's side. Uh, in terms of the instrumentation themselves, it's obviously hugely simple. It's a very basic economy car. You have a speedometer, you've got a couple of uh, gauges for fuel and uh, temperature, and you've got a few warning lights which are sort of dotted around the car. If I just turn the uh, ignition on for a moment, you'll see some of them come to life. Over on the centre console, we have some heater controls which are quite simple or with the fan there. We've got air distribution there and we've got heat on that one, so that's cold up there and hot down below. I'll sort of leave it in the middle because it's actually really cold right now. Uh, and then we've got some secondary buttons here for heated rear window, hazards, etc. And that's for your main lights. Uh, we have a nice little clock with a tiny little Fiat Panda, very cute. Uh, an air vent that's adjustable. 
we've got some air vents right by the um, window there that, uh, or the windscreen there that sort of blows a bit of air around as well. So one of the things that you notice when driving this car is that it has got three stalks around the steering column. There's one on the right hand side for your wipers and then there are two on the left hand side. So the front one operates your indicators as usual, but the back one operates your dim dip for main beam on the lights. And I always find when I drive this car that when I'm turning left, what I tend to do is, as I would drive a normal car, is I would bring my finger down and click it down to turn left. But oh no, all I've done is dazzle oncoming drivers. Uh, so it takes a real skill to try and remember that actually you need to always hit this front uh, stalk and not the longer back stalk. Uh, it would, for me, make much more ergonomic sense if they were swapped the other way around. Uh, but then uh, the owner has pointed out to me that uh, if at night you need to dim dip in an emergency, you do need that one to be very accessible. So I suppose I take his point, but most of the time you are indicating, I suspect, but there we are. The cabin itself, I will admit, is actually pretty cramped. Uh, I mean, it's got everything you need, but things like the doors are very, very close to your elbow when you're holding the steering wheel. So you feel quite constrained inside the car. Um, also, the windscreen is really very, very close to the steering wheel. So you've only got, say, 10 centimetres odd between the top of the steering wheel and the glass, uh, which does make it feel like the car is quite encroaching on you and it makes it feel like a really very small car. Neat little trick the Panda has is when you fold the seats forward, it's not just the, the backrest that goes, but it's the entire seat that folds forwards to give you quite decent access. And to give you a proper flavour of it, I am sitting now in the back and it's, I mean, it's all right. I wouldn't want to be here for a particularly long time. My legs do sort of feel quite trapped up against the kind of metal bar at the bottom of the driver's seat there. Uh, certainly if there was a taller driver, it would be even worse. Uh, it does feel quite small in the back as well. Um, I can very easily touch the other side of the car from where I'm sitting. Uh, but the rear, you know, the boot is kind of reasonable distance behind me. It's not too bad, but I wouldn't want to do a long journey in here. And of course, who could forget, there is an ashtray for rear seat passengers just in here. Let's take a look at the luggage compartment. Uh, unlike a lot of other 90 city cars, this does actually have a proper knob so you can open the tailgate and leave it unlocked if you want to. Uh, the boot itself is looks reasonably small, but actually is surprisingly capacious and Jim has carried an awful lot of things in the back of this. It's very, very square and it's actually reasonably wide. It's uh, the full width of the car. I'm not gonna take any of these cars for a drive today because otherwise it'll make the video way too long. And I have driven this car. It's quite nippy, but it is not very refined. It's extremely noisy at speed. Uh, you've got a lot of wind noise, tyre noise, engine noise, all kind of contributing to make it quite an echoey environment. And I suspect that factor in 1996 is what would make me go and have a little look at the Cinquecento. So let's go and do that. Let's move on to the pride of Poland, the Fiat or Polski Fiat FSO Cinquecento. I think I've seen these door mirrors somewhere before. The Cinquecento is a significantly smaller car than the Panda, it's much shorter, but it is taller than the Panda and it's much newer, so is it better packaged inside? There are certain touches that make this car feel a little bit more modern than the Panda. Things like a covered fuel cap, proper door handles where you don't have to sort of struggle to stick your hands inside the body of the car. A curved windscreen, an aerial that's in the normal place for aerials, two wipers, and a generally more sort of aerodynamic, curvaceous shape, even though it's very boxy and wedgy at the same time. There's more than a hint of Lancia Ypsilon about the design of the Cinquecento, and certainly Top Gear, uh, when they reviewed the Cinquecento in the early 90s, uh, did make the point that why they bothered to design this car when they already had one identical to it in the Fiat family. And I suppose that's a point worth making. The other question to ask is why did the Panda not get discontinued when the Cinquecento was launched? And that's because in the Fiat world, the Cinquecento is a class below the Panda. The Panda is bigger. Don't forget, however, that missing from this three car lineup, I would have slotted in in the, the gap there, is the Punto, the uh, first generation Punto, which was launched in 1995, which was bigger again than the Panda. That would replace the Uno. So Fiat really loved making a variety of small cars that were very slightly different sizes. 
And if you have been on holiday to Italy and seen some of the tiny little towns and villages that cars have to uh, exist in there, you would probably understand why small cars are so popular in Italy. Right, let's go and have a look inside the Cinquecento. So your first contact with the Cinquecento is this rather cool door handle, which uh, very easily lets you in to the cabin. The door opens to reveal actually a broadly similar door to the Panda. You've got uh, lots of bare metal on display, uh, a very simple looking door pull, and you do get a door pocket, although this one is a full length one. The door closure is however much more classic uh, than in the Panda. And again, just as the outside, the uh, adjuster for the mirror is identical to the Panda. Looking at the interior of the Cinquecento, you really do get the sense that it is essentially the same but different to the Panda. You have the same basic design of a shelf for a dashboard with a floating centre console on it, but it's an altogether much more 90s affair made of grey plastic rather than fabric. Looking properly around the interior, you've got this kind of funky 90s fabric on the seats, which is really very pleasant indeed. There's a fabulous big area in front of the passenger there for a load of stuff. Uh, if you want to, no closed glove box, but you know, that's it's an economy budget car. Underneath the um, storage area, you do get the space little shelf there for the manual for the car, which is quite a neat little touch. The instrumentation uh, is actually broadly similar to the Panda. Uh, you have a very simple uh, layout of the uh, instrument cluster with just a fuel gauge, some warning lights and a speedometer. You don't even get a temperature gauge in the Cinquecento, it's that basic. Moving on to the centre console, you have, again, broadly similar heater controls, but they're uh, arranged in a different fashion, so hot and cold, blowiness, where the heat should go, and then some various ancillary controls, heat through a window, etc. Uh, you have two big air vents here, but a bonus from the Panda, uh, a step up, is that we do get moving air vents uh, on the side here as well and separate demisters built into the dashboard for the windscreen. We have a massive ashtray, of course, just there. This particular car is a very late Cinquecento, and for the 1998 model cars, they changed the steering column uh, to give you the essentially the Seicento steering wheel and stalks, uh, which means the older Cinquecentos had the same stalks as the Panda with the double one on this side. But the Seicento stalks are a much more traditional layout where you've got the light controls on here and dim dip is like that, as well as obviously your indicators. What that does mean is you're left with these funny little blanks here for things that would have been uh, controlled separately and are now controlled on the stalk. Again, very similar to the Panda, we've got a speaker over there on the right hand side and on the left hand side, but they're integrated into the dashboard this time, so it's a bit of a neater affair. So let's step into the back and see what that's like. Very much a repeat of the Panda story, we have basically the same handle, making the seat travel in precisely the same way as the Panda. That seat movement does make getting into the back of the car very easy, exactly the same as the Panda. I do, however, feel like I've got more leg room in this car. Although my legs are right up against the seat, there's not a metal bar at the bottom of the driver's seat, um, making me feel a bit more constricted. So I feel like I've got a little bit more space. Another difference uh, from the Panda is that the seat is actually much more moulded and it feels therefore much more comfortable. It grips you, you've got an indentation where you're supposed to sit and a little bit of a hump in the middle and the same with the backrest. Uh, whereas the Panda's just got a really flat bench, so this does definitely feel a little bit more supportive. Again it's quite small and I can touch the other side of the car, but I think actually this is wider than the Panda. Uh, I'm having to stretch more to reach the other side of the car. However, the rear boot glass really is right behind me, so I really wouldn't like to be sitting in the back of this whilst we're being rear-ended. Another upgrade from the Panda in the Cinquecento is, in the back anyway, is that you get this little cutout in the uh, sort of door card, so you can actually rest your arm there, which just makes such a difference. You just have that tiny bit more space, it's just a little bit more comfortable, which means that I wouldn't mind travelling the back of here uh, for a longer journey, whereas I'd really want to get out of that one. A little sign that you've stepped up in the world of luxury slightly is that you've got a little lever here which you lift to operate the boot, which means you don't always have to unlock it with the key. The tailgate lifts up really high and reveals a pretty small boot, but again it's not terrible. You could certainly get, you know, your weekly shop in there fairly comfortably, one big suitcase perhaps. Uh, it doesn't seem as wide as the Pandas and it's not as deep as the Pandas, but it's not horrendous given how teeny tiny the car actually is. So what's this cabin like in comparison with the Panda? Well, 
I would say it's a touch more roomy. There's a little bit more elbow room here. And there's actually also quite significantly more headroom. And that would make sense because it's a taller car than the Panda. You sit very upright in the Cinquecento because of the way that they've designed it. It's a really short, short car. So you sit upright in order to take up less space in the car. It makes quite a lot of ergonomic sense. Things like the distance between the windscreen and the steering wheel is much, much greater than in the Panda. You've got sort of 15, nearly 20 centimetres, I would say there. And all of that gives you a feeling that this is a much more modern proposition than the Panda. And certainly when you're driving it on the road, it does uh, show that. It's got a smaller engine. It's only got an 899cc engine with 39 horsepower. So it shouldn't be particularly fast, but it is actually incredibly nippy because it's so light and it's perfectly geared. But the very big difference between this and the Panda, both of them are nippy, but this is much more refined at speed. So you can do 70 miles an hour in this car and you don't really feel like you're doing 70. You can still have a conversation. Yeah, there's some tyre noise. There's a little bit of engine noise, but there's hardly any wind noise. And that kind of drag coefficient friendly design uh, really shows because you, you just get better airflow. So you just don't quite get that same buffeting that you get in the Panda. And all that together with the kind of style of the cabin, the greyish plastics, do make this feel like a much more modern place to be than the Panda. Let's then move on to the daddy of the Fiat range for this sort of period, 96 to 98, the Morea. Specifically here, the Morea Weekend, which means that it is the estate version. Now, the Brava Bravo were launched in 1995, and a year later, the slightly extended front and rear version came out as the Morea Saloon and the Weekend Station Wagon, which means that for all intents and purposes, this is in fact a Brava Bravo, albeit a slightly more practical version. Although it was based on the Brava Bravo pair of mid-size hatchbacks, which are sort of escort rivals, Fiat pitched the Morea as a class above, as a rival to the Cavalier or the Mondeo estate, and that, I think, is a bit of a foolish move on their part because I don't think it could possibly stack up against those cars because once you have a look in the cabin, as we'll do in a moment, you really feel that it is clearly a mid-sized car. It isn't a large car. The design language of these two 90s cars really is very different and reveals how much car design changed even in a short amount of time. The Cinquecento is still super, super boxy and angular, although aerodynamic whereas the Morea has a much curvier version of aerodynamicism so that the air just kind of slips around it much more rapidly. It's also a much sleeker front end to the very blunt front end on the Cinquecento and, of course, the Panda itself. OK, same as before, let's have a look inside the Morea. We have a conventional door handle, but again of a different design, which opens to reveal, this time, a full door card covering all the metal uh, of the door skin, which in immediately lifts the car and makes you feel like you're no longer in the realms of budget motoring. The door card also reveals little touches of technology such as the um, electric window switches. The door release handle is much more moulded and feels like it's part of the design and you've got this kind of nice swoops and curves everywhere that sort of interlock and make it feel like someone's actually bothered to design it rather than it just sort of happen somehow. Looking around the cabin of the Morea then, in comparison with the other two, uh, again you get some uh, lovely 90s fabric. This is uh, sort of a very purpley hue to this fabric. But you get the immediate impression this is a much darker place to be than the other two cars. You've got much darker plastics on the dashboard and uh, instrumentation. Uh, you've got a larger centre console here in the middle that kind of takes up space which altogether combine to make this feel like a bit of a darker place to be than the other two cars. They seem lighter and brighter and a more fun place. This seems a little touch more austere, just in terms of the, the colours and the ambience. Even though they try, the fabric is kind of a really funky 90s purple pattern, which I really very much like. Looking around the dashboard itself, well, this is a complete contrast to the other two cars. And you realise that you really have moved up a class here significantly. You have lots of moulded plastic, lots of swoops and curves that all meet together with this kind of centre console here, which is all terribly neatly laid out. There's none of that sort of floating shelf, which gives you a sense of solidity, but it doesn't give you a sense of space. I feel much more cramped in here, even though it's a bigger car. 
Looking at the instruments and controls themselves, well, you've got a much more grown-up steering wheel to start with, which has got an actual airbag. The Cinque Genso looks like it might have one, but it doesn't. Uh, it's even got steering wheel controls, so you're really posh here. Uh, the dashboard, again, has much more information going along on it, so you've actually got a rev counter this time and a bank of warning lights along the bottom. Column stalks are similar to the Cinque Cento uh, in the more sort of traditional fashion and rather than the um, fussy Fiat fashion that you see in the Panda. Turning to the centre console, we've got our usual classic sort of couple of pairs of air vents and some climate control controls, including air conditioning. So we really are in a much higher tier of car here than the other two very basic utilitarian cars. We've also got a centre console, which has got some oddments, that kind of thing there. Uh, we've got sort of plastic happening here with some lovely coin storage there for all your lira. Uh, in fact, possibly euro. This car was, came out in 1999, so I think the euro was around there. So yes, for your euros. Uh, and you have an armrest here, which opens up for some storage. If this was the mid to late 90s, you would really feel that this was a much more grown up car. It was a much more expensive car. It was a safer car, certainly. Uh, but you wouldn't necessarily feel that it's a more spacious car, certainly not from the driver's seat. Yes, it's wider. You can't quite touch the other side. You just feel quite cramped in this car compared to coming out of the Cinquecento, which has clearly been really cleverly designed to make absolutely brilliant use of tiny amount of space. Getting into the back of the Morea is significantly easier than either of the other two cars because you actually have rear doors. And sitting in the back, well, you do get a little bit more of that juxtaposition that I was talking about in the front. It's certainly a lot more spacious than either of the other two cars. I've got way more leg room here, so it's much more comfortable. I've also got stacks of headroom. But again, it feels like a gloomier place to be than the other two cars. It's darker. I've got a massive headrest in front of my face, which means I can't really see what's going on uh, on the road ahead other than sort of through the centre there. You do get uh, an ashtray here for rear seat passengers and you even get an air vent. So that is proper luxury for the mid-90s and what's still a fairly cheap-ish car. So what is my conclusion on these three cars? Well, as you can now see as we're panning out, the other two cars have gone. So my choice is definitely with the Cinquecento. And why is that? Well, I think there are a couple of reasons. The first one is that the Panda for me is just not quite the right Panda. Uh, if it was the early Mark I Panda from the early 80s, then I would love it for its purity of design. But by the mid 90s, when the other cars were around, the Panda was woefully outdated and only sold in its home market in Italy. The Morea is again a flawed car. It's not such a classic design as the Cinquecento. It's not such a beautiful piece of industrial design as this. It's also flawed in that when it was sold new, it was outclassed by quite a lot of its competitors in terms of usability and refinement. Whereas the Cinquecento wins out in that respect because in a lot of the articles I've read about it, people were really, really keen on it. Um, they you know, thought it was as a competitor to the AX uh, and that kind of thing, that it just really worked and it was a fantastic little city car. The Panda is obviously a much more utilitarian design, but that's utilitarian in the very early 80s. And by 1996, which is the kind of reason for this video, it would have been woefully outdated and is outclassed by its younger sibling, uh, its Polish younger sibling, in fact. Um, so that's why I think I would go for this one. That, that wraps up this video. This is my choice and it's the one I'm gonna drive home in today. Well, thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this little video comparing uh, these three Fiats um, and it's slightly unusual three Fiats that were in fact sold at the same time as each other. Um, join me again in the next video where I will be looking at something completely different. And in the meantime, please do like and subscribe to the video. It does make a real difference and I really do appreciate it. See you soon. Bye.